Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, I greet you all in the name of Jesus Christ. It is so good to see you all this morning. Welcome to all who are joining us online. As we continue to worship, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious, loving God, God, we give you thanks that we can gather together as brothers and sisters in Christ, as your body, God, and worship you. But God, remind us now that our worship isn't just what we do here in this hour, but our worship is the way we live our lives, what we center our lives around. And Jesus, that is you. And if it's not you this morning, we trust that you're going to continue to work in our hearts till you're at the center of everything. So gracious, loving God, we lay ourselves down and knowing that you lift us back up. Let it be not us who lives, but Christ who lives in us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please stand and join us now as we sing the lion and the lamb.
I'll be reading from Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 through 40. Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. This is the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated and would all the children please come forward for the children's sermon. Good morning. Good morning. How's everybody today? Good. Good. All right, just a couple of reminders. We still have pumpkins up here that are to go to shut-ins in the community. So if you have a neighbor or someone that you know, please take a pumpkin at the end of service and take it with you. Drop it off on their porch. You don't have to even go in, knock on the door or anything. Just leave it there as a nice surprise. And it has a little tag that tells them that we're praying for them and that it's from the children and youth of Three Crosses in Pleasant Grove. And also, fall festival is this Wednesday, 5.30 to 7.30. So we're going to have lots of fun. And we're going to be going around to the Sunday school classes to talk more to the adults about fall festival as well. So we will be doing that later. All right. So today was the day that everyone in the whole church was challenged to memorize the verses from the Roman Road series that the third through fifth grade class has been studying. I don't know about you, but it was a lot to memorize. And I even failed at this task. So today we will not be displaying our memorization skills, <laughs> but we will be sharing about what we learn. If you did happen to memorize your assigned verse when it's your turn, you can recite it from memory, but if not, I've got it here for you, okay? So the K through 2 class also started a new lesson called the Bible Alphabet, and their memory verse is also from Romans. I know Miss Deb has been here with you the last two weeks, working with you all on memorizing your verse, and that you all are learning that following Jesus isn't complicated, it's as simple as A, B, C, D. Does anyone from the K through 2 class know the verse, Romans 1, 9? You can give it a try, Johnny. The spirit of... I serve God with my whole heart. Romans chapter 1, verse 9a. Very good. Thank you, Johnny. All right, so now we're going to go down the Roman road with the third through fifth grade class. So the Roman road is not a physical road, but a path found in Romans to lead us to heaven. Our lesson series was titled X Marks the Spot because each week we had a skit with two pirates, Mr. Jones and Captain Quest, who were walking the Roman road. The first week they were in quicksand because in week one we learned and BB is not here, so I'm going to give it to somebody else to read. Molly, will you read this, please? Romans 3, verse 23. Everyone has sinned. No one means measures up to God's glory. All right, so week two, our pirates were playing or were um, playing Marco Polo in the dark and talking about their fear of the dark because they were on the road to darkness. Jenny, do you remember Romans six twenty three? Okay. When you sin, the pay you get is death. Very good. All right, and week three, we finally got some good news. As our pirates found the light and began walking down the, ro the right road. So, Asher, you had the second half of Romans 6.23. Romans 6.23. But God gives you the gift of eternal life. That because, that's because of what Christ Jesus, our Lord, 
has done. Very good. Week four, our pirates learn where to find the treasure that they were seeking. And Beckett, you had Romans 10, 9. Romans 10, 9. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. Very good. All right. And then week six. No, week five. Our pirates are finally able to chill out in paradise with some lemonade because of Romans 5, 1. And this was Emily's verse. Emily isn't here. Um, I'll go ahead and let you do both of them, Quinn, yours and hers. We have been made right with God because of our faith. Now we have peace with him because of our Lord Jesus Christ. Very good. In week six, we learned that the pirates learned that no one can steal their treasure because of Romans 8, 38 through 39. I am absolutely sure that not even death or life, life can separate us from God's love, not even angels or demons. The present of the future or any powers can separate us. Nothing at all can separate us from God's love. That's because of that's because of what Jesus our Lord has done. All right. So please give it up to the children for what they have been learning in Sunday school. Okay. All right. So that's all. I'm going to say a quick prayer to dismiss us and then you can go back to your seats, okay? Dear God, we praise you and thank you so much for the parents bringing the children here to learn more about you. Lord, I pray that they will remember all the steps on the Roman road and that they will seek salvation and also teach others on how to become saved as well. In your name we pray, amen. What do we say to the congregation? May the Lord be with you. And also with you. I'm nervous this morning, <laughs> and uh, I, th I think it's because I'm talking about something that I've not figured out completely yet, right? It's not something that I've got right, and uh, that definitely makes things uh, a little different. But I do have something that I want to start off with that'll help me, I think, set this up. When my grandfather passed, my dad wrote a poem, which I didn't know my dad could do. Um, and he wrote a poem about my grandfather, uh, and we read it at his funeral. And it goes like this, it's titled, Our Hero. And it says, he taught us to be men, that man treats everyone with respect, that a man's word is his bond, that it's okay for a man to cry, that a man provides for his family, that a man honors his Lord and teaches his children about him. He taught us to be husbands, that a husband loves his wife, that she's to be honored and provided for, that she's his equal, not his possession. And he taught us to be fathers, that you teach by example, that you discipline with love, not anger, that you build your children's self-esteem with praise, and that family is more important than possessions. He taught us to be men, our hero, our dad. And it, and it gets me every time I read it. It moves me to my core. And I realized that as I was putting my notes together for today that you probably don't have the same reaction that I have because this is personal to me, right? It's personal to my family. And so when I read each one of these lines, I'm picturing something that they've told me either my father or my grandfather. I'm picturing life events when I was walking with them. And I've had the privilege of uh, growing up with both my father 
and my grandfather. Right? I was a, got to know them as a child. I got to know them as a teenager and even as an adult. And so those experiences that I had with them, some of them were at my best, some of them were at my worst, and they seen all of those. And I can now look back as a mature adult and see what they were trying to do and what I was learning at that spot in my life. And that kind of relationship is what Pastor Lee was talking to us about last week, right? If we're talking about a relationship that you are walking with someone, that when you look back on the events, that you remember them, you remember the good things, the bad things that you went through, and you remember how they were there with us. And so I want you this morning to be thinking about who that person is in your life. I want you to figure out that relationship, right? It might not be a father or a grandfather. It might not be, a, it could be a mother, but it might be a mother-like or a father-like influence. It might be a friend or a spouse. Um, but I, you need to have that relationship in your mind as we go out and we talk about this so that you are thinking about a life with Christ in a physical, true format. Because if we're going to listen to God and to Christ, we have to have that same type of relationship with Christ. So when we open up this book, this isn't just a poem for my family, and it's not just special to me, but when you open up this book, you're reading the words of somebody that you have walked with and that are taught you things. I should read these words, and when I do... They should hit me to my deepest core of my heart, to the spot where I to the spot where I do the things that I shouldn't, and that should dig into that pain and it should show me those things. But the good thing is is that after it finds those things, now it's a healing process, and it heals those things. And so just like when I look back at the fact that my grandfather's not here with me today but I remember the things that I, he walked with me with, and I remember the joys that come along with that and how that he helped me get to where I am today. And so when we look at the things and the pain in this book and the pain in our hearts, we can have that connection that says, you know what, but there's joy and there's peace in these words and there's love. So that's the kind of relationship that we're talking about today. It's one where you can reflect on the memories that we've had with that person to the point where you can value the relationship higher than any other. And if you don't think, if you can't come up with that relationship in your life, I want you to know that God wants that relationship with you, and hopefully today you'll see that kind of relationship and that he's already working on you. The fact that you're here right now shows that God's working on a relationship with you, and now we just have to work on our response. And there's also... There's many people in this church that are willing to walk with you as well on that journey. And so once we acknowledge that we are in a relationship with Christ, um, we re recognize that God is our Father and that we have accepted Christ as the perfect life um, and gift that allows us to be a child of God, then we've got to understand that there's an order to this relationship. There's a structure to it. And so if my grandfather needed something done, we did it. <laughs> we didn't ask why. We didn't ask when it needed done, because we knew if he told us it needed to be done then. We might have small influences on the specifics of how we got it done if he wasn't giving us, you know, hand signals. We could figure that out. And I think as I watched my father and my uncles respond to my grandfather as adults. Um, I realized that that adult relationship with my grandfather, that obedience doesn't stop when we become men. And I think there's a tendency for us as we get become men that we start to look for obedience in other people and we forget about what it looks like for us to be obedient instead. But there's always that hierarchy to our lives. There's always a structure to this. 
And it's only when we realize that we are not the, that we are the weaker one in the room, that we are not the alpha dog, that we can truly accept our role in the world. So I've, I've always been a big guy. At 14 years old, I was six foot and 200 pounds. And before I got my driver's license, I was pretty much the same size I am today, except I was much more athletic, right? Six, and uh, I've always been the bigger guy in the room. I've always had that privilege to walk in and be the big guy. And I can't tell you how many times I walk in a room with somebody else and they tell my friend, oh, you brought your bodyguard with you today, right? That's the joke. And, and I've been successful in my career. Um, when I go to w meetings at work, uh, if I speak up, people listen. Uh, I enjoy being the subject matter expert. I enjoy knowing what we need to do next. Um, I like setting a vision. I can manage a project. I can see ways we can improve. I can help manage towards success. But did you hear how many times I said I? I, 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 I. That's a, it puts me in a position of power, and I, I like it. <laughs> um, but we must come to the point where we realize that I can't do something before we can ask for help. We must realize that we're weak and we need help before we can understand the peace that comes from the type of relationship that we're talking about. Because if it's I, man, we don't need God. If we're the strongest person in the room, we don't need him. And we know that's wrong, right? When we accept that fact that we are weak and that we need him as men, then we can truly have an encounter with God where we truly receive agape love. And I've probably forgot to click through some slides. There we go. Agape love. Agape love is a love that places the good of another ahead of your own, no matter the cost or sacrifice that it may require. And I think as soon as I read agape love, and you may have too, I thought about where I've given agape love to somebody else. I'm still thinking as a man, well, I did that yesterday. I gave some agape love out. But that's not what we're talking about. That's not the point. The point isn't about us giving. It's about us receiving. And so I tried to rewrite this definition in a way that allows us to receive it. It's a love that places my well-being ahead of the Son of God. No matter what I've done, no matter what it costs, no matter the sacrifice that it required, He still loves me that much. And when we accept that love, we accept a sacrifice that was made. If we just say that Jesus' love, um, Jesus loves me without acknowledging the pain and the suffering and the sacrificial death that came with that love, we've not accepted Jesus. You can't just accept the love part and not accept the pain and the suffering and the sacrifice. And if we can't accept it, we can't give it away to our wives and our children and to others. So what does obedience look like for us as men? Well, if we're in a relationship, if we acknowledge God as our Father, we need to investigate the things that he said. The example that he showed us, the people he sent to teach us with the disciples. And the one thing that I saw whenever I was studying this is what's the number one thing that Christ told us to do? Well, we go to the, what's the greatest commandment, right? Our scripture for this morning. And he tells us to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Out of all the things that he could tell us to go do, it's just as simple as love. It's not to be strong. It's not to be wealthy. It's not to be successful in your career. It's not to have respect when you walk in the room. It's not to own your own business. It's not to be the CEO and call all the shots. It's just to love. And when Christ gave this uh, response 
to the Pharisees. He was, had been tested by the Sadducees. He was surrounded by the Pharisees, men in high places, right? And they were probably looking for that business answer. They were looking for how do we do this, right? But the response that he gave to the men that could judge people, the men that created the laws, the men who were in charge of their community, he told them to love. And that's it. And we know what love is because we've started this whole series with 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And it goes through love is patient and it's kind. It doesn't envy and it doesn't boast. It's not proud. It doesn't dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not angered, easily angered. It keeps no record of our wrongs. It doesn't delight in evil but rejoices in truth. It always protects, it always trusts, hopes, and perseveres. And it never fails. So even with that great description of what love is, I still struggle with how do I apply this? How in the world do I do this in the real world? And so I think we've got to have some definitions to help us understand it. And those may be a little small, but we'll read through them. We've got to understand these four things, I think, for us to understand that love and how we actually apply this in the world. The first one is deny. And to deny means the intentional separation from relationship with a particular person. So if I deny Christ, I have denied him and I have separated myself from Christ. If I deny myself, I am denying myself in behalf in pursuit of Christ. Submit is to give up something for a decision to be made by somebody else. So in my I scenario, where we're men and we're getting things done, I don't let other people make the decisions. I make the decision and I move us forward. And so I have to know how to submit. Surrender is to give up something or give control of something to someone else. So it's not just letting them make the decision, but it's letting them run the project, letting them lead. I have to sit back and let them be in charge. And to sacrifice is to give up something that is so valuable to me in order to help another person. And we know that the sacrifice that we're talking about with Christ is he took all the way to giving his life willingly for us, right? What is our sacrifice? We have to understand these definitions to apply the love of Christ to others. And if you've never accepted the true life-giving love that Christ offers, how are you going to give that love to your wife, to your children, to others, and to yourself? So we have to understand what that love is in order to push it back out. We have to deny ourselves. We have to intentionally separate ourselves from the mission of Christ. And when I was talking about this with Pastor Leah, she's like, is that how you want to say that? And I said, well, I think it is. But it's because we have to separate ourselves out of the mission of Christ, it being that we have to take us out of the equation and just let God do his thing. We're not leading, we're not running this, we are denying ourselves, we are submitting to Christ, we are surrendering to Him, and we're sacrificing whatever we need to in order to make that happen. And so what does that mean for you? What does that denial look for you? Is it a, that next hunting trip? Is it the next weekend on the lake? Putting in a little bit more overtime? Do you need to uh, get things done on the farm? Or is it washing that new truck? I'd like it to be that, but I don't have a new truck. For me, maybe some of you, it might also be uh, the next person that asks, instead of taking care of my household, I'm helping them. It's easy to help somebody that asks me until it's in my house. And it's because of the reward that I get, how that makes me feel. But man, our greatest mission field is loving our wives and our children at our household. So we also have to submit to Christ and accept that his decision to choose love 
is true and it's pure and it's righteous. His decision that we have to submit to, we have to accept that. And so have you accepted that we are to love regardless of the response to our love? And so I think when we're dealing with the public, with others, that's easy. We know they're not always going to respond with love, but I can be kind as the guy's driving by me, waving with a special signal, right? I can still choose to love him. But when I'm interacting with my wife, am I choosing to love, regardless of her response? Or am I constantly seeking for the response that I want in order for me to love? In Matthew 5, Christ tells us that if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? That's the easy one, right? But we have to choose to love regardless of the response. It's not love in order to receive. Christ loved us regardless of our response. And so we don't get to choose who we love. We have to surrender to Christ with our life. That everything that we do be for the glorification of the Father. And so can you accept that as your only purpose in life is to glorify God? I think I lose sight of this more often than I like. Um, and it's easy when I'm here doing band or working with youth or doing this that I can see, okay, I'm, I'm doing it. I'm checking boxes. I'm doing this. But when I walk out and I do work, I'm craving that praise, right? And so I have to accept that what I'm doing is not for me. What I'm doing is for the glory of God. We have to sacrifice all that which is most valuable to this flesh in order to love like Christ and to love like Christ loved the church. To the single men, this sacrifice, I think, is what we've got to get right. So if you're single, get this right, and you'll be ready for your wife. To the married men, you get this right, you don't have to sleep on the couch tonight. But we have to sacrifice everything that is most valuable to our flesh in order to love like Christ loved the church. And in all seriousness, we can't even begin to talk about what it means to love our wives and our children until we get this. We don't, have to be, we don't have to have a perfect score on the exam. We don't have to be perfect, but we have to understand what that love looks like and what it should look like when it comes back out of us. We must know what this sacrificial, surrendering, submissive, self-denying love is supposed to be. So the next part I want to look at is Ephesians chapter 5. And as I was thinking about that, I, was, I typically don't bring my Bible to church. I bring my iPad and I use my digital Bible, right? Um, I actually had to get the dust off of this to bring it in here today. And I, I was about to put Ephesians 5 up on the slides, and I decided not to because I it hit me with an example of if I ask everybody to open up your Bible and turn to Ephesians 5 with me what is your response? And men what do we do? Have we got our phone? And that's great. But are we prepared at all places at church to open our book and do the hard thing of opening this up and being ready to study? We're setting examples. And so I want to turn to Ephesians chapter 5. And Ephesians chapter 5 is a, a lesson to us on Christian households. And it tells us what we're, how we're supposed to lead. And what I thought was interesting is that, you know, when Paul was talking about this, and he's given instructions about our wives. Um, 
But a wife was not something that was... Um, you did not get your wife in the same way that most of us have selected our wives, with that love before it starts, right? It was a totally different relationship, and so I want us to think about that. But in Ephesians chapter 5, this Christian household part, it starts around verse 22, or 21. Um, but verse 22, I think is probably, as a man, our, our favorite verse. Is there anybody recognize Ephesians chapter 5 verse 22 wives submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord <laughs> right that's the one that we want to jump on and we're like yes remember that one Aaron that's the one you need to remember um, but it, the instructions didn't start at verse 22 the instructions start at verse 21 and it's submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And so in this instructions, we can't have a wife, we can't go into that relationship until we figure out how to submit to one another in this setting and outside of these walls. As men to men, we need to be able to submit to each other. As peers. We, know, we now know that submitting to one another is a commandment for not just the men, it's a commandment for everyone. That submission is love. And all persons entering a relationship must be prepared to do this. It's not the sole responsibility of your spouse to take the lead and submit first, to surrender first, to love first. It's yours. In verse 22 and through 24, it says, Wives, submit, to yourself, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. And we really like, again, I think this is abused all the time. We really like this verse. But this should be scary to us, guys. This is not a gift. This is a responsibility and a challenge and a requirement. What I want us to focus on as men is that this is not a description of superiority. This is a very big assignment for us. The body cannot move without the head. And this description here says, for the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. And so we have to love in the way that he loves. And if we're the head, the body cannot move without the head unless you're a chicken. I've not actually seen that happen, but I hear that's a thing, right? And so unless we want our families to walk around like chickens with their head cut off, we've got to be in. We've got to be there. Our wives, our children, our families cannot grow if we're absent, if we're not thinking, if we're looking somewhere we ought not to be looking if we're not listening to the word and the directions of Christ. Verse 25 through 27 says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. And so this is where I think about the times, right? Married men, how many of you got your wife with uh, goats and chickens and sheep? And we didn't barter and trade for our wives. We had the opportunity and the privilege to meet our wives with love and to pursue them. And they chose us. But then, in that time... They most likely didn't marry for love. They married for business, for family development. Uh, their wives were a business deal. And so when Paul tells them to love their wives, this was crazy. This was a radical thing. This was not as easy as us thinking about loving our wives today. This was not normal. And just like everything else in Christ's um, Christ's explanation of his kingdom, it's just a bit upside down. 
But it, it is our job, if we can simplify it to that, to first love our wives, to deny, to submit, to surrender, to sacrifice for them. But he gets very detailed on the purpose of that love. Um, we are to make our wives holy as Christ made the church holy. To make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or blemish, but holy and blameless. And so when I think about that, the image that pops into my mind is my wife on our wedding day. That's the image that I get. But that's not the purest she needs to be. It's my job as the head of this household to be loving her in a way that is helping her on her path to sanctification by God and becoming more and more like Christ. That's my job. That's our job as men. It's not just loving her so that we have a quiet home, a happy home, the kids work well, everything's nice, everything goes smooth. It's loving her for a purpose of making her closer to God, sanctified and more pure. And that's, that's scary. Because I know at this point, 24 years in, I've not done the greatest job. And so I want you to picture the beauty that this describes and the target that we're looking for. Holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. That's not beating her overhead with scripture. There may be a time every now and then when we're in the car and Aaron's giving me her problems that I give her a scripture every now and then. It's very fun to watch. It doesn't work very well, though. <laughs> but we are responsible for her sanctification. It's not a position of authority or a power that we have over our wives because we are first to submit to each other. So guess what? She's also responsible for my sanctification. Our submission is supposed to be bringing us both closer to Christ, both working towards unity with Christ. And that submission, if done with the love of Christ, means that we both get there. Verse 28 on through the end of this section is in the same way husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. And after all, no one ever hated their own body. But they feed and they care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of the body. And for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be uni united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. And this is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. So how can we as men fulfill the expectations of our Creator to love our wives, to love our children, and to love each other if we're not pursuing our own sanctification by having a relationship with Christ? We have to love ourselves. We have to be pursuing Christ. We have to put our boots on and get to work. We've got the eye. We know how to go out there and get things done. And if, God forbid, something was bad to happen outside, I know that the men in this room would step up and we would do everything we could to protect the people in this church. That's why we got to do this. We have to because our wives and our children's and our friends' lives depend on it. Get up, get involved, study, pray, teach, lead, volunteer, donate, deny yourself, submit to God's plan, let Him make the decisions, surrender to His authority, let Him run things, and accept His sacrifice 
so that you can feel that love and put that love back out into the world. Wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine upon you. Let us pray. Dear God, I, I pray that you have um, opened the hearts of not only the men, but everybody here today, because we all came here for you. Some part of us is searching for you and is pursuing a relationship with you, and we know you are doing the same with us. I pray that the words that were spoken today, that they make sense, that you've used these to get to the hearts of your people, and that there's a fire that burns in us, and there's an action that comes from us hearing you and hearing your words, seeing your example, and feeling your love. Be with us as we go out through the rest of this week and on into the future that we are thinking about glorification of the Father, denying ourselves, submitting to one another, surrendering to your authority, and giving the sacrifices that we can in order to just bring glory to you. And we do that all in love. Not from our own strength as men, our own strength as people, smart, intelligent people, but we use those gifts with love and pursuit of you and of glorification of our Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Would you please stand and join us now as we sing our closing song, Build My Life.
I started this with, I'm not, I was pretty nervous today because I don't have all this right. And we don't have to have a perfect score, but we have to be trying. And uh, got the chance to go to the Caring For You uh, concert last night, or Friday night with Josh Wilson. And one of his songs, I just want to read a part of it, and it's I Refuse. It's I don't want to live like I don't care. I don't want to say another empty prayer. I refuse to. I refuse to sit around and wait for someone else to do what God has called me to do myself. I could choose not to move, but I refuse. And so this is a challenge, and I hope everybody feels excited and encouraged to go out and do the things that we're called to do. It's a blessing to be able to do what God has asked us to do and to know what he's asked us to do. And so this isn't a beat down. This isn't a, I feel bad about how much I'm not doing well, but it's a challenge and an excitement to go out there and do what he has called us to do. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.